Board Game Breakfast. Well, we just got back from the UK Games Expo last week, and this week we are going to Origins. So if you're at the Origins Game Fair in Columbus, Ohio this week, we certainly hope you stop by and say hi to us. We're in the middle of Hall D. It's on the map. It's marked Origins Summer Preview or just Summer Preview. You can find us. We're between Yellow and Eagle Griffin and Mayfair and WizKids, I think. So if you're looking for us, we're around there. We'll have a lot of promos from last year's Kickstarter and other things that if you want to come donate to the show and get some of those, um, or if you just want to come and say hi to us, or if it's after hours during the day, we're going to be doing live streaming. If it's after hours, you can come hang out in our, in our booth. But uh, if you're not going to Origins, we're going to be live streaming from Origins this week, doing a lot of different things. Um, to, today... Board Game Breakfast here has been posted early in the morning. I'm going to be doing a couple of live events here at the studio at uh, 9 o'clock. I'll be doing a Q&A, so if you have questions, come on in and ask those. And at 10.30, uh, we'll be doing an Origins preview. Where we'll be going through some of the things coming out of Origins so you know what to expect. We did a lot of things last week. I'm not doing a week in review this week, but there were several videos that went up last week. But I really want to call your attention to the top five exciting moments in gaming. That was uh, from, we recorded it live at the UK Games Expo. And in my opinion, it's one of the best top lists we've ever done. Not because of anything I said, but because of the different people and contributors that came on. Really great stories. You really got to check that one out. All right. Well, let's get started. Okay, well first we'll start with the news, and there is not much news this week, mostly because it's a kind of a truncated week for me. Um, but Z-Man has a new website up where they have an interview with Steve Kimball, who's the head of Z-Man Games. Uh, Steve was the head of Fantasy Flight's Euro game branch, Wind Rider, which has been folded into Z-Man Games, so it's now one whole conglomeration. The Diana Jones Award nominations have been announced. Now, this is kind of a strange award. Diana Jones, it's called that because uh, a while ago there was a fire that burned up some stuff and they found a copy of Indiana Jones role-playing game, but part of it was burned off, so it only said Diana Jones. So this is an award to give out to something that like really affects gaming as a whole. And the things that they have in here are Gloomhaven, Terraforming Mars, End of the Line, which is a LARP, uh, Romance Trilogy, which is an RPG. The Beast, which is a card game probably no one should play. If the game is kind of a loose description of it. And Gen Con. So this is a very odd mix. They do this every year. Sometimes they have a person. Sometimes they have a website. And, you know, they have a game. So for me, it's kind of weird like to say Terraforming Mars or Gen Con. Um, I don't know. Especially since the awards are handed out at Gen Con. So does Gen Con have the edge? I don't know. Either way... It's an interesting award. And you know what, folks? That's all I got. So let's hope Suzanne has more Kickstarter stuff for us. Happy breakfast, everybody. If you're lucky enough to be going to Origins Game Fair this week, I hope you have a great time. We, of course, have our own gaming news in the crowdfunding world. So let's take a look. Zombicide Green Horde expands on the fantasy world of Zombicide Black Plague. If you're unfamiliar with Zombicide, this is a cooperative game that plays up to six as you take on the roles of fantasy medieval characters fighting off waves of fantasy race zombies. Weapons are thematic and spells are added to the mix as well, and characters can level up, making them stronger but also increasing the zombies. Zombicide Green Horde is a standalone expansion that brings new races with new abilities to the game as players explore, equip, and battle. Some equipment has synergy for extra bonuses, and you'll need that as you face the new Orc Zombies that deal out massive damage in Horde attacks. But the survivors now have access to a trebuchet that takes a lot of effort to use but has a ton of reach. 
The new boards offer new terrain that offers different benefits and risks, and come on, this is cool mini. The game is packed full of high-quality miniatures and a ton of stretch goals, including Kickstarter exclusives, have been unlocked. A single pledge of $120 plus shipping gets you a copy of the huge Zombicide Green Horde game. Awanu takes place in ancient Egypt in the City of Pillars. In this game, you'll work to expand your influence in the city, gather citizens to you, and build a lasting dynasty by working to satisfy the demands of the gods, protecting your people from invaders, and ensuring their place in the afterlife. The designer, Todd Sanders, is known for his elegant game design and often minimalist visual design. Awanu features hand management and set collection as you work to leverage different citizens' abilities smartly. Will you use a noble to collect tax or a soldier to shore up your defense? Which citizens will the baker feed? And so on. And the afterlife cards change up the way things score, adding some nice variability. Awanu is available in a travel edition for just $9 plus shipping or a deluxe edition for only $19 plus shipping that includes wood mitts and dice. War of the Worlds is a solitaire game from well-known war game publisher Dan Versen Games. Based on the famous story of alien invasion, War of the Worlds is actually a series of solitaire games with each city providing different challenges. The scenario determines the map layout, placement of enemies, etc. The game is set in the age of cannons, and as you gain resources, you'll be able to purchase cannons, troops, and more to fight the alien menace. While the legendary tripods move through the land, people flee as refugees trying to reach ships to sail to the safety of the sea. To win, you'll need to help refugees escape and destroy the advancing tripods. You lose if the aliens capture too many locations and too many humans die. While each game is solo, you can combine different cities to fight with friends. Each player controls their own city and you can aid each other by trading supplies and troops. You can choose from one city of France, Japan, England, or the U.S. for $50 plus shipping, or you can get all four cities for $175 plus shipping. Kitchen Rush is a real-time cooperative worker placement game that uses hourglasses as workers. The energy of working in a professional kitchen comes through as you work together to take orders, make meals, spice them, and serve. When you use a worker to take an action, that 30-second timer cannot be used elsewhere until the sand has run out. You must keep the kitchen running through four rounds for four minutes and meet your customer and income goals and achieve enough prestige to win. You'll work together to prioritize stations to activate and different orders, bonus, and office cards add variety to the game. Kitchen Rush is quick to play and features that unique worker placement element of time. You can get a copy of Kitchen Rush for a pledge of $55, and if you're lucky enough to be going to Essen, you can pick up your copy there to avoid shipping fees. Metal Dawn takes place in 1984, when our defensive computer system Dominus has turned on its human creators and produced an army of machines to take over. In this cooperative game, players are the elite agents tasked with protecting the nation's capital, stopping the robot army, and to deactivate or destroy Dominus. In Metal Dawn, players work together to complete missions, destroy robots, maintain control of board zones, and most importantly, recover the intel needed to hack into Dominus. Gear will boost you up, and different zones have different abilities too, and each character has a unique special ability, and players get an agency power that has a huge impact but can only be used once per game. And if you want a different challenge, there's an optional competitive area control mode that takes place after Dominus has been taken out and the world factions are now fighting each other. You can get the Cooperative Metal Dawn for a pledge of $60 plus shipping, and for $79 plus shipping, you can get the Deluxe Edition that includes the competitive game rules and components. And last but not least, Minerva is a game of empire building designed by Hisashi Hayashi, the designer of trains, Yokohama, and more. Originally published in Japan, Pandasaurus Games is bringing us the deluxe edition of Minerva, featuring metal coins, wooden bits, new art, and more. Minerva is a game of resource management and tile placement. You'll use resources to buy buildings, which you must cleverly build out in your city, because when you activate buildings by adding a residence, the buildings in the entire row are activated in order. And residences are a limited resource, so you only get so many activations during the game. Therefore, building placement and timing is absolutely critical. You'll also be making tough choices as you have to decide whether you'll place a building for the relational points or for its production, and there are multiple strategies for victory. 
Minerva is available in a standard edition featuring that new art by Franz Volwinkel for $40, or for $60 you can get the deluxe edition that features those metal coins and screen printed wooden pieces. Okay, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. This episode is full of value because I'm saying it is. Hi, I'm Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise, and welcome back to the second in our three-part series on minimum advertised price or map policies. Well, last time, we confirmed how Yellow's new map policy doesn't prevent a store from advertising a board game lower than a specified price. It just prevents them from telling anyone about it in any way, shape, or form. Now, while some may see it as an unhealthy thing to allow a product's manufacturer to dictate a product's market value instead of those who are actually trying to sell it to customers, it's actually a pretty wise approach. At least, that seems to be the opinion of Simon Games, another board game publisher who recently launched a map policy of their very own. In a press release, Simon clarified the benefit of their map policy, stating that by unilaterally imposing restrictions on minimum prices advertised by Simon's new distribution network and retail partners, Simon products' perceived value in customers' eyes will be enhanced, which is in the best interest of consumers and Simon's partners. Well, thank goodness someone is finally enhancing board game value. Up to now, publishers have had to increase the perceived value of their products by developing better written rules, higher quality components, and more engaging gameplay. Idiots. Who knew that all this time, the real secret to creating games with a higher perceived value was simply to advertise them for a more expensive price? Simon Games! That's who! Now, some may think that reducing the number of distributors that carry their products, thereby suppressing price competition, and then demanding that retailers advertise their products for no lower than 15% off the price that they arbitrarily specify, may seem to be in opposition to the customer's best interests. But, nah. I mean, all we need to do to prove that Simon's press release isn't a complete festering load of hot garbage is to look back to the recent Kickstarter campaign for their much-anticipated game, Rising Sun. I did back Rising Sun, and just like Simon predicted, by the time its campaign ended, my $100 pledge now provided me with far more than $100 worth of content. With so much bang for my buck, my perceived value of the game was greatly diminished. <laughs> I barely want the thing anymore now. Because if it's one thing that consumers hate, it's comparison shopping and competitive pricing. At least, that's what this consumer perceives through his eyes. Hi everybody, welcome to Miniature World. Well, what are we talking about today? Well, miniatures, that's the most important thing. What I'm really excited about was the latest expansion to come out, which was Arcadia Quest Fire Dragons. Now, if you've seen the work I did on the Frost Dragon, you'll know that I really had a great time painting this. And this really, these, these two expansions, the, the Frost Dragon and the Fire Dragon, add so much. It gives you another thing that you can mix in there and really have a good time with it. it the cards, the new weapons that come with it, but our real hero of this whole Whole thing is this guy right here and that's yep the fire dragon himself and as you can see this is a absolutely beautiful miniature I had such a good time painting this and it was really really easy and I really just enjoyed painting it and and really just detailing it up and getting it ready for our game and when we played it I thought it was just fantastic so what do I give this this expansion I'm gonna give it an 8 out of 10 I really enjoy this I suggest you go get it and I think you'll love it too until next time I'm Rob Orn we'll see you soon I saw 
summon my champion, Father Benjamin. Oh, hello there. Today we're going to take a look at my favorite game of all time, Summoner Wars. The setup for this game is actually fairly easy. Um, after each player chooses a faction, uh, you already start with a few units on the battlefield and a wall, setting up the units according to the reference card from your unit. So on a player turns, you have six possible actions, which starts by drawing cards, and then you can summon one of your units and paying the cost from your magic deck. You can play event cards by putting them on your discard pile and taking the action showing on the card. You can move your unit up to two space, Always forwards or sideways, never diagonally. And the fun part, you can attack. And the first player that defeats the summoner from your opponent wins the game. Summoner Wars is probably the game that we play the most together. Probably. I love the battle system. The game is adventurous itself. Yeah, I. the cards sometimes are uh, hard to understand. I think they try to squeeze more information they could on the cards, but other than that, this is an excellent game. I love, 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 love game. Especially the um, alliances. The alliances is probably much better than just the regular Summoner Wars. Yeah, it's because you can add so many factions and we can build our own deck, which you like to spend more time doing that than playing the game, but it's a worthwhile. If you never play Summoner Wars, you gotta check it out. Yeah. It's a really good game. And I see you guys next time. See you around the gaming table. Bye. Bye. Hey, Star Productions this week. So what is going to be happening on our show? Uh, I mentioned we're doing live streaming at Origin. So uh, starting Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, and Saturday, actually four days, you're going to see live streaming. Now, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're going to be interviewing different people, different publishers. They're going to come on. They're going to show us games that are coming out that are either just been released or about to be released on our show. So we have a whole new switching system now with cameras and all. So we hope that this is a really interesting thing. You'll have a chance to ask them uh, questions live, or some of them uh, questions live while they're there. So hopefully this is a really cool, interactive, fun experience for you guys. And that will start at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday and go through 5 p.m. each day. Um, you can see, I believe we already have all the stuff scheduled so you can uh, maybe subscribe to those and just keep an eye when they're gonna come out. And we hope that you enjoy those and come along for the ride with us. There'll be a few other reviews that go up over the course of the week, but not much more than the, you know, the basically the live stuff from Origins, and we'll be back in full force next week. Of course, we also have our brand new version of Dice Tower, a new episode of that's coming out on Tuesday with a brand new guest star, or a guest host on the show. And we also have a whole lot of uh, other podcasts that are putting out stuff, and you can find all that stuff at DiceTowerNetwork.com. All right, let's continue. Hi, everyone. It's lunchtime. lunchtime. Today, we'll be looking at Rhino Hero. It's a game published by Hava Games, designed by S Stephen Strumpf and Scott Frisco. It plays two to five players, ages five to 99, in about 15 to 20 minutes. So, like Sister said, it's, it basically it's a kind of a Jenga style game. So you're playing some wall cards, and then you play one of your roof tiles from your hand. You'll have five in your hand, and you're either trying to get rid of all those cards or have someone else knock down the building. So as you build it up, you have your little rhino who might appear on some of the cards, and he's a wooden piece on these paper cards, so he makes it a little wobbly. And if it topples over, well, you lose the game. I used to play a lot of uh, card games as a kid, and building, you know, card houses, houses out of cards, was always a, a fun pastime to, to while away the minutes. Mm -hmm. And I like that for this. I really like moving the rhinoceros hero, you know, up the <laughs> stack of the the, the uh, sky rise building that we're building. So. That's always the best part because then it topples over and everyone gets angry, and ah. then you play again and everyone has fun. <laughs> so I think this is a fun one to do at lunch. You can play it several times over. It's super short. Um, 
I know when you play with kids, I don't know, maybe just because they have like little fingers, I find they're able to, to build it really high as adults, you know, we try and get in there and <laughs> falls over, but I think it's really fun. It's true. I, I just like how sometimes you can reverse the play. So the person that you're normally going to play, going to play next to you, you actually turn back to the person you just played. You can miss a turn. You can play double cards. Yeah, so I think definitely this is a keeper and one that will be, you know, bring to the office often. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Laugh every time. Exactly. Fun stuff. <laughs> So that's it for now. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Hello, everyone. My name is Annette, and you may know me as Netters Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over Baron Park. I'll show you exactly why I like this mechanism of tile lane in this game, and also show you a little bit of what makes it so unique. So let's get to it. So here's the setup for Baron Park. As you can see, this is the main supply board where you're going to pick up tiles in order to place them in your park areas. When you lay one down, you're going to cover up an icon, which will let you go ahead and pick one from the supply area. So for example, if you cover up any one of these wheelbarrow icons, then you can go ahead and pick from any one of these tiles in the wheelbarrow area. Again, if you cover up any of these truck icons, then you can go ahead and pick from any one of these tiles. If you cover up this construction crew, then you can draw from either one of these two piles to add to your park. These new park areas will also add in an excavator. This excavator will let you draw from any one of these bigger enclosures, which contain bears and a lot of points. When placing tiles, you can never cover up these holes. However, if you do complete a full park area, then you get the highest value bear statue and cover up that hole. So what I really like about this game is the fact that it has a really high cute factor. It's easy to introduce to any gamer and it's easy to teach. Another great thing about this game is the fact that it's a tile lane game where all the tiles are different shapes and sizes. You're trying to complete these square areas in your park by placing tiles down. And when you do so, you're covering up these icons. These icons will dictate what you can pick up and what you can place later. And that flow of the game and that system of tile lane and that mechanism is what makes this game super unique. So that's why I like Baron Park. All right, so let's take a look at what's on the shelf. So here we have the deluxe version of Carson City. Carson City is a great game. Quinn and Mega Deluxe version, which had expansions and all sorts of really cool stuff inside. I love Carson City. It's one of my favorite worker placement games. Easy edition. Dungeon Pets. Dungeon Pets, I think, is much better than Dungeon Lords, and Melody thinks so even more, which is why Dungeon Pets is still on my shelf, because Melody likes it so much. Manhattan Project. This is a great game about building atomic bombs and stuff. Not about dropping them or anything, but just about building them. But it's a great worker placement. Put workers out, pull workers back. Really recommend this one. Baseball Highlights, a deck building game which simulates baseball in a really fun and entertaining way. It's fast, it's simple, but where the game really shines is after your first game, you then start building a deck with players that you see coming out and their players are cyborgs and androids and things like that. And it, there's like a bit of a sci-fi future. Even if you don't like baseball, it's a really great game. Over here, we have different dice towers. This is one of the space dice towers. This is from E-Raptor. I tend to like these. I got our 20-sided dice. You may have seen these 20-sided dice. These are the three that we use when we do a top 10 list. Uh, here I have an orange foam four-sided dice. I don't really like the shape of four-sided dice, but this one looks good on the shelf. Then we have a couple giants here. This is a hill giant. I bought a couple bigger giants to use in Assault of the Giants. And this here is the Storm King, although it looks like he's dropped whatever he was holding. Uh, and his arm is missing, but, well, kids and all that. But still, i got a couple giants here guarding my shelf. So that's what's on the shelf this week. Hello, my name's Dan, and this is Cora, and we're here today to talk to you about board games for children of around five and under. And today we're talking about this game. What is it, Cora? Timmy Tidies Up. Timmy Tidies Up. In Timmy Tidies Up, the players are trying to clean up a very messy house. There are six rooms in the house, each with three gaps that need to be filled up. 
On your turn, you roll a dice to see which room you need to tidy up, and then you pick a face-down puzzle piece that you think is going to fit in one of the gaps. If you complete a room, then you take a wooden chip as a reward. The person who's got the most chips once the house is completely tidy is the winner. This is a game for very young children, and as a result, there isn't a great deal here for grown-ups at all. However, the components are really nice, and as with a lot of young kids' games, the adult's enjoyment really lies with the interaction with the child and the experiencing of the joy that they're taking, rather than with the game itself. So, Cora, what do you think about this game? Uh, I think it's good. Why, why do you like it? Because it's puzzles. Puzzles? <laughs> Lots of jigsaws and things like that. <laughs> yeah, you have to work out if it goes in the white one. Yeah. And I normally win. Yeah, you normally win. I'm really good at it. So, like, I roll the dice to get something that's already done, or there's only one more thing, yeah. and they get a chip every time. Yeah. It's my turn. Oh, the alternative is it's a completely luck based that's game. I'd so rubbish at it. I'd, yeah. Yeah, all right, yeah, I'd rubbish yeah, at it. You have, but you keep getting the tips before me, yeah. and I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, it's completely luck based. After me, Emily. There's no skill decision making at all. Um, it's a game that would be very good for very young children, actually, especially yeah. young children who like um, jigsaws and things like that. I can see yeah, us like playing three. this with uh, with my three year old niece. We give it two um, t tidying thumbs up. Two tidying thumbs up. Nice and neat. Welcome to the thrift store where two brothers with five whole dollars attempt to find the most interesting or strange board game from yesteryear and review it for you. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. All right. What's Kay. up, guys? Okay. Guys, I got a great game. It's a Twilight the Movie game. Who's trying to play? Who's huh? getting the table? Who's coming to the table? Fernando? So, does anyone else want to play? So this, unfortunately, is Twilight the Game, a game in which we're going to be moving through the story of the first book and movie, collecting scene cards along the way. We need scenes one through seven first. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off by rolling my die. On all the spaces, we have red daggers or white daggers, which refer to challenges that you get from your Twilight cards. If you ever roll onto a white space, you're gonna have some sort of dice based challenge or answering a question about the other players in the game. An example might be roll two dice. If the total is six, seven, or eight, you complete the challenge and you get a scene one card. Red daggers are gonna be trivia based on the book and film. An example would be what nickname does Edward call Bella when he takes her climbing in the trees? I unfortunately know that the answer is Spider Monkey. We're gonna be working our way through the story. You can move backward or forward because you wanna make sure you get all of the scenes before you can go for scene eight, the prom, and hopefully we can win and enter into Edward's sweet blackened heart. So that was Twilight the game. It was as bad as it looked. It's, I guess, I don't know what I expected. I always, for some reason, have hope. A lot of the challenges were just, like, half of them are literally, like, if you're all even, you, you complete the challenge. That's not a good game. And some of the challenges were a little skewed for us. And this yeah. one's like, the player to your right writes down how many siblings they have. It took me a couple tries, we but got I got it. there. So it's kind of like a get to know you game. They, they trick you, and I don't like it. In the moment, you're kind of like, oh, this is kind of fun. Like, oh, this yeah. is okay. What like, do I like this isn't too bad. doing? And that's... That's, this game sucks. Well, cheer us up. Please tell us what games that you have found. Please. If they're any it. better than this. And uh, until next time, I guess we'll see you at the thrift store. We'll see you there. Conventions. We talk about conventions all the time on our show. And if you're new to board gaming, or even if you've been in board gaming for a while, it may seem like you're missing out if you don't go to conventions, right? And we don't mean to feel that way, but obviously the Dice Tower does contribute to that because we go to different conventions. And so the question is, are conventions important to attend? Well, there's several categories for that and for the answer for that. So first we have, and I, and I hesitate to use the word ordinary, but just a gamer. Someone who's not involved in the game industry, we have a gamer. And then we have designers, or wannabe designers. I'll include you all together. Then we have, and I would include artists in that category too. 
Then we have publishers who have published a game. And then we have game media like myself. Now, who should go to a convention? So we'll start backwards. For game media, we really need to go to conventions. Uh, we need to uh, talk about the games that are coming out. It's a good way to talk to people face to face. Our, the internet has gotten much better with emails and tweets and all that. But the fact is, is there's nuances and things and you can see things uh, early and ahead of time. And if, if, if as game media, if you're not going to conventions, you're not growing. You're not getting better at your business. We need to get better. Now, for game media, what conventions do we need to go to? Well, obviously, we need to go to ones that have a lot of uh, things announced at them. So we, as Daystar, we need to go to Gen Con. We need to go to Essen. We need to go to Gamma, probably Origins, UK Games Expo. Um, those are ones we need to go to. But we also go to other conventions because besides meeting designers and publishers and seeing things that come out, I think it's really important to meet the people that watch our stuff. And that's why we go to little conventions and other conventions, regional conventions and Dice Tower Con and things like that, because it's a way for us to say, hey, and talk to you and get feedback directly from people and just communicate with people to show that we're people, we're gamers. We're not just people putting on a show when a show is like, ah, oh, wiped it, uh, you know, I'm not doing this. Like someone does a cooking show, but they hate eating food. No, we love gaming and we want to talk to people. So I think it's really important for media to go to conventions. The difficulty there is there's too many conventions to go to. So you have to pick and choose, especially in a budget, which ones you can go to. Publishers. Publishers need to go to conventions. I really think that if you are a publisher and you are skipping major conventions, you are doing a disservice to yourself. Yes, these conventions are outrageously expensive. Yes, going to a convention may actually cause you to have a technical net loss because you paid more money to go there than you got in the product back. But the word of mouth, meeting people, making contacts, finding new designers, talking to people, just getting the word out there about your game is an invaluable thing. And if you watch most companies who don't go to conventions eventually shrivel up and die. You don't need to go to all the conventions, but going to conventions is a good way to get people to play your games. And the people who come to conventions are often tastemakers and will go back home with your game and play with their gaming groups and show to other people and then those people might buy your game. So for a publisher, absolutely important. Scale from one to 10, 10, same with gaming media. Designers, artists, I don't think you have to go to conventions, but I think it's a good idea to go. When people say, I'm a new designer, how do I get publishers to look at my game? I always tell them conventions. Because at a convention, you can make a meeting with a publisher and you can go there and show them face to face your game. You send something in the mail to somebody, and I know this because I've gotten games in the mail, it is much harder for that person to want to look at your game. They'll get it and go, eh, yeah, I'll get around to this. Yeah, that's not nearly as exciting. You want people to be like, ooh, this looks interesting because you put it on the table in front of them and your enthusiasm can help sell it. But also as a game designer or want to be game designer, you want to go around and see new stuff. You want to uh, learn about new things. You want to talk to other game designers in person. And I think that's also very important. And you also just simply need to network. People say, how do I get involved in the, in the game industry? Well, network. You go to conventions, you meet publishers, you meet other people, and you continue to go, and after a while, they know who you are. Many people who are working in the game industry right now, I used to know them because they used to come to game conventions all the time, and now they're working in the industry because they love the industry. But let's talk about the gamer. And again, I hesitate to use the word ordinary because I don't think people are ordinary. I think people are extraordinary. But the gamer, someone who's not a designer or a publisher, they just love games. Do you need to go to a convention? Well, there the answer is much more nebulous. I don't think you need to go. You say, but Tom, you're always talking about how amazing and wonderful they are. Sure, they're wonderful, but I don't think you have to go. Just like I don't think if you like dogs, you have to go to dog shows. Or if you like cars, that you have to go to a car show. You might have perfectly fun gaming with your group and what is a gaming convention going to do for you? If you want to see all the new stuff, you can kind of see it online and it's going to show up at your store. If you just want to play games, sure, you can play games with people there, but you might also play games with your gaming group. If you're looking for an exciting experience akin to going to an amusement park, well, maybe you should go to a game convention. But I think so many people, uh, sometimes it comes across, maybe for me and other people, like you have to go to a game show. Like if you haven't been to Essen, what's wrong with you? 
There's nothing wrong with you. You don't have to go. In fact, part of the reason we do go to conventions and we show different things is so that you can see what's there and see all that stuff without having to spend the money to go. Conventions are expensive, except for Dice Tire Cruise, which I think is a really good deal and you really should go on it. Okay, advertisement over. But conventions are expensive. You got the traveling cost, hotel costs, food costs. You're gonna likely buy more games than you normally would have because they're sitting there and tempting you right in front of you. So there's a lot of costs involved in a convention. And is that worth it? Are you getting your money's worth out of it? So yes, I think it's fun to go to conventions. It's neat to see new stuff. It's fun to meet designers and publishers face to face. It's fun to meet other gamers. Some conventions you go to and there's not all that stuff and you're just playing games the whole time. And some people don't have that opportunity in their game groups. But I was just reading a blog about some people who went to the UK Games Expo and pretty much hated the majority of their time there. That it was too crowded. They didn't get it to do everything they wanted to do. You know what? If you're someone like that, then you probably should not go. And I don't think the, any less of you for doing so. I don't, you know, I love crowds. Being in crowds is fun for me. But at the end of the day, you know, with the big crowds, even then I still want to go and sit by myself for a while. But I like crowds a lot. Not everyone does. If you don't like crowds, you should probably consider not going to a big convention. If you have a great game group who gets up when you play games all the time, you should consider maybe you shouldn't need to go to a convention. So while I love Origins and Gen Con and Essen and Dice Tower Con and all these things, and I really think it's a lot of fun to go, and I think that maybe in your lifetime you might want to pop in at one at one point, and maybe you want to go to lots of them. You know, if you want to go to them, that's great. But never feel like you have to go. Gaming conventions are really important for those of us in the industry. They really are. But if you're not in the industry, you can have just as much fun at home. Hi, Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. Convention season is here, and while my local convention is Gen Con, this will be my first chance to go to Origins, so I figured I'd take a look at some of my top anticipated solo games at this year's Origins. These are in no particular order. First, we've got Witches of the Revolution. This is a co-op game with an intriguing theme where you're playing covens of witches trying to influence the American Revolution. Certainly intriguing. I'll have to take a look at that one. This War of Mine is a Kickstarter game that uh, is being released uh, soon where it's kind of a theme of war, anti-war, and it's based off of a popular video game license, so I'm interested in that. Escape from 100 Million BC is a Kevin Wilson game, uh, another adventure co-op game with some intriguing uh, art and uh, mechanisms that have got my attention. Next, we've got the Uwe Rosenberg one to two player version of Caverna, uh, kind of a smaller take on the big box game. Definitely want to look at that. Next, we have The Lost Expedition, which is another adventure co-op where you are trying to uh, play through event cards and uh, have your adventurer survive on the path to El Dorado, I believe it is. And next, we've got Flatline by Clayne Klenko. This is uh, in the Fuse universe, another real-time, fast, uh, frantic uh, co-op game. And then finally, we've got Okie Doki, a small... Um, number playing cooperative game kind of reminds me of the game uh, a little bit and uh, so I like the art I like the small footprint and the small price point so I'll be definitely taking a look at that so there you have it my most uh, anticipated solo games to check out at this year's origins thank you so much for your time and have a great day Hi, this is Gary Pope from Late to the Table, and this is the What Should I Get segment where we basically go on the board game subreddit and look at the What Should I Get mega thread and we suggest games for people. So let's go ahead and start. LitchVader69 is looking for a board game for their husband's birthday. They prefer a meteor game that has deck building components and is cooperative. So if you want games that fit that perfectly, I'd go with Aeon's End, Xeno Shift, and also the new Arkham Heart card game. But if you also want to try something a little bit different, then also try going for Burgle Brothers. Drop Bear is looking for a board game which is a little bit more complex that's for two players but also could go up to four players and they prefer sci-fi themes. Besides a lot of the games you already own I would definitely would recommend Forbidden Stars. It's going out of print soon and for the time being you can actually get it for pretty cheap. Kyle125 is somewhat new to the hobby but they don't want to push over games so they want to avoid gateway games. They want something a little bit more complex and also that's competitive. Now if you want to ease into competitive games a little bit I'd go with Dead of Winter. If you want a really cool looking area control game I'd go with Comet or Blood Rage. And if you really want to start diving into heavier games, but 
this one isn't all that hard to understand, go with Dominant Species. The Ever Clan wants a classic style worker placement game that isn't Agricola or Caverna. They also want one that plays from two players and up fairly well. For this one, I would definitely would suggest Yokohama, Manhattan Project, and Robinson Crusoe. Duck Down usually plays with two to six players and they already have a couple gateway games and are looking for the next one to get. Now, if you want an area control style game, go with Mission Red Planet. If your friends really like the risk and also love Game of Thrones, go with Game of Thrones the board game. If you're looking for a social deduction game, go with Insider or Fake Artist. If you want a really thematic game, go with Betrayal at House on the Hill. And if you need another party style game, then definitely go with Code Names. Now is another segment, What Should I Get? Be sure to post your questions on the board game subreddit under the What Should I Get mega thread that posts there just about on a daily basis at this point. And this was Gary Pope from Late to the Table, and I hope you're enjoying your breakfast. Today we're taking a look at a Spellbook Academy. Um, this is from, well, this is a Spellbook from Elderwood Academy. Okay, you can see their name right here. These come in different colors. Uh, you can get different symbols in the front. I would prefer, honestly, no symbol in the front or a picture of a dice tower, I guess. But hey, you know, this makes it look more spellishy. Inside, you can have one of these inserts. So I have two different inserts here. So maybe this insert here. You can put a, a pen in those different spots. You also have a spot, you know, for the different dice that you may have. So here I'm putting a six sided. Here's my 12 sided. Here's my 20. Here's this round one I keep for no reason at all. And so you can have dice in these spots. Put other things in here, maybe a miniature. Then you have the, the pool here. This is kind of a, the mirror of reflection or spell books. So what you can do with this is you can write on it. So I can be like, uh, plus one, two, attack, or whatever. You can write on this, so it actually is a mirror, so you can see yourself in the camera. Woo! Ugh, who's that guy? Anyway, and you can, but you can also, you know, write on here. It's dry erase, so you're able to, to take that off and use that. So this is kind of a nice way to store things, but also use it in the course of the game. And you can even take the inserts out and use it to roll dice in, as long as you don't bounce them out like I just did. So this is from Elderwood Academy and this is their spell books. Hi everyone. This week I want to talk to you a little bit about hyperloops. A hyperloop is a proposed method of transportation for passengers and freight where a pod-like shaped vehicle is propelled through a low pressured tube. This new form of transportation will have a lot of advantages. Low power consumption, no fear of collisions and immune to weather conditions. In 2013 Elon Musk described it as a cross between a railgun, an air hockey table and a Concorde airplane. This week in Amsterdam, the Hyperloop One company unveiled nine different European routes it might develop. The first operational system probably will go live in 2021. This week I am playing a game that is all about moving underground, but not as futuristic. This week I am playing the brand new game, Awesome. In Awesome, players are miners and try to get more money than their competitors. You do this by rolling dice each round and moving your minecart along the track. You might want to end up on a tile that is your color because when you start digging for ore, you will get more profit from it. But if others know where you are, they might want to sabotage you or even push you away. Once everyone is done moving, players start digging and sell their ore to the bank or for even more profit, fulfill a contract with one of the two contractors. Holding on to your ore because you want to fulfill a contract might be costly because there is a dexterity element to the game. Your cart can only hold as much ore as you are able to stack on it. And should at some point something fall off your cart, it will stay there on the tracks for someone else to pick up. The game comes straight from the UK Games Expo and is brand new. The components are great and my family loved playing with those fun cards. My son especially liked Scraps the dog who guards the ore against thieves. So that is awesome. My name is Dave Luza. Thanks for watching. How do RPGs at conventions even work? Hi, I'm Chris Renshaw from the Boards and Swords podcast. Welcome to role playing.
Rivian Creek, I hope I'm saying that right, posted this comment. Speaking of RPGs at cons, I wonder if you could do a segment on how exactly RPGs work at cons, i.e. what do you need to bring, what the GM is likely to provide, how to navigate the event grid to find beginner-friendly events, etc. In the case of board games, of course, you don't need to bring supplies or anything. You just show up, learn the game, assuming the rules are taught and play. RPGs are obviously a different animal. Well, that's actually a very good question. And the answer is, it's not very different for RPGs at all. The real question is finding that beginner friendly game. And the way you need to do is when you look in the RPG section of your event grid, whatever convention you're going, usually there'll be a column that says, begin. it'll either say beginner friendly, experience required, etc. For example, this week is Origins Week. And I will be at Origins running games every single day for the Cypher system. I will have characters, I will have dice, and I will be fully prepared. I'll give a little bit of a, a spiel about how the basics of the system work. And then as we go into the game, as a new piece of mechanics come up, then I will like, oh, by the way, this is how combat works. I've partnered up with the excellent people over at Easy Roller Dice who make some really amazing looking dice. There may or may not be some free goodies at some of my sessions, so even if you don't have dice, you're more than welcome to come sit at my table. I'll teach you everything you need to know. If you have any other questions or comments, make sure you can either put them in the comments below. In the meantime, I'll see you guys at Origins. Thanks for watching, and may all your hits be crits. Hello, Board Game Breakfast World. My name is Neil Sills, Brettspieler, and today in the best and the worst hostage negotiator fun rider games, let's jump into it. My favorite part on hostage negotiator is the pressure you feel, the perfect theme they built in. You are trying to talk with the abductor. You are really trying to bring hostages free. All the artwork, all the cards, all of that giving you a brilliant feeling of this uh, really torturing discussions with the guy who helped the hostages. Brilliant! I love that. However, the thing I don't like too much, it, it really boils down to your dice rolls. I mean, you can try to get two, three, or one die. Obviously, you wanted three. Uh, and then you're rolling, and if you have successes, it helps. But if you don't roll successes, especially in the first round, it's really, really, really tough to win the game. And I have to say, wow, I mean, there's a lot of, la uh, lot of luck involved. Whew! That was my favorite part on negotiating with some guy, uh, guys. Uh, yeah, let's see you next week here right on the Board Games Back Breakfast Dice Tower channel. My name is Niels. See you. Bye. Hey, Mikhail here for Snakes and Lattes. Have you ever found yourself next to somebody you don't know and kind of at a loss for conversation? Maybe you're both waiting on a mutual friend and neither of you really feels comfortable starting the game of Assassin Mutual yet. Maybe they're just renowned for being incredibly laconic and you still haven't found a way to break through their stony exterior. Maybe they're a game component, in which case I suppose the silence would speak volumes. For those awkward times, all you may have to do is dig into a pocket to break the ice. I'm Mikhail, this is Games Without Games, and today we're looking at Babylon. <laughs> Babylon is a tiny two-player abstract by Bruno Faiduti, designer and co-designer of several Snake's favorites, including Mission Red Planet and Citadels. The version we're going to be looking at today was published by Foxmine. The only components in Babylon are 12 stones, three each in four different colors. Every turn, a player must take a stack of stones and place it on top of another stack with the same amount of stones in it, or take a stack and place it on top of another stack with the same top stone. This will continue until one player cannot make a legal move, at which point their opponent will win the game. Like a lot of good two-player abstracts, parallels are easily drawn to games like Connect 4 and Tic-Tac-Toe, ones that people might be familiar with from when they were younger. So the contents of the game can easily be replicated with what you might find in your pocket or change purse. Here, we'll be using Canadian coins. Remember, stack on top of light color or stack on top of same amount of coins. If you happen to have a little collection of foreign currency at hand, Use coins of comparable size for a deluxe edition. They did a really good job with the physical release of this game. It's even got its own little pouch. As far as games go that can fit into a pocket and carry around to impress your friends, 
you could do a lot worse. Hopefully knowing the rules to this and having a pocket full of change will get you out of at least a couple different awkward situations, especially the ones that you'll run into a lot, but I'm starting to babble on. This has been Mikhail for Games Without Games for Snakes and Mates. Thanks for watching. That's it for another board game breakfast, folks. Thanks so much for coming along and joining us. Don't forget, we'll be doing a live Q&A today and a live Origins preview where we go through and we'll talk back and forth and maybe answer some questions about Origins itself. If you're going to Origins, we hope to see you this week. I'll be there. Sam, Z, Eric, many other folks will be there. So we hope to have a good time talking to you and hanging out with you. We have a schedule online. Um, we have a live show Saturday night. So we hope that you come to our show. It's right after the Origins Rewards in the same place. I'll also be doing the Sunday morning worship service at Origins too. So either way, come by, have a lot of fun. And if you're not there, don't worry about it. You're not going to miss anything. You'll be able to watch it through our streaming. So keep an eye on this channel. Thanks, folks, for watching Board Game Breakfast. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and this has been The Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.